here um, fellows of the um, college, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, President Delani, guest um, Aseli Gunavordana. Um, it's a great honour to be invited uh, to, to give you the oration at this meeting. We've heard so many wonderful lives already uh, being honoured at this meeting that um, it seems almost um, unnecessary to go on. But go on, I must, because I've been asked to do this. And, and when I look back on uh, why we're here and what a career is all about, it seems to be all about uh, learning and learning for a lifetime. Um, Chidu Krishnamurti, um, an Indian philosopher, said that there is no end for education for any of us. It's not that you read a book or pass an exam or finish, you finish with education. Education is for your whole life, from the moment you're born to the moment you die. And so I'll go back before I was born, and this is my mother, who was a refugee from Germany. She lived in Germany during World War II. Her first husband um, died in the um, Dachau concentration camp. Uh, but she had a daughter, and, and Potter and her daughter um, Elizabeth came to Australia to seek a new life. There she met my father, who was also a refugee from a war-torn uh, country, and uh, both looked to make a new life in Australia. But um, the great uh, Greek philosopher Diogenes knew, as my parents do, that the foundation of every state is the education of their youth. And like I'm sure all your parents and all your children appreciate, your parents want you to have a good education because they know that that's important for not only for you but for the country. So there was me. Um, I had even less hair than I do now. And, um, and in a way I had two mothers because my older sister was 12 years older than me. And my older sister, still, still to this day, she's over 80 years old, she's, she um, loves games. She'll play Sudoku and everything. She loves, and she taught me games. And as a young child, I remember learning games, learning numbers, learning mathematical tricks. And so by the time I, um, now she did have other influences on me and I'm glad they didn't um, proceed too far, but <laughs> dress, dressing me up as a girl, a little sister. But anyway, I got to school and by the time I got to school, I was already prepared by my parents and by my sisters for a life of learning, as I'm sure many of your parents also do to you. Um, interestingly, out of this page in my um, 1965 textbook, I said, um, I did not think the stories could be true. <laughs> I was a very doubting child even then. Um, but I achieved my fair share of um, elephant stamps, which is sort of good work. And um, by the way, that was the first day that Australia moved to a decimal system. And this, a decimal system made it so much easier to calculate money. Um, and I loved numbers. I loved numbers from, from a child. And I love this thing, which some of you might know what it is. It's a slide rule. It's the way we used to do calculations. The way engineers and even, uh, even doctors used to do calculations. And in 1974, I bought a calculator. Back then, it cost me $40. That would be equivalent to $400 or more now. And all it did was addition and subtraction. And this, was, this calculator was banned in our school because they thought that calculators and computers would destroy our understanding of mathematics, which is strange for us to hear, but that was the attitude down back then. So. Um, I went to this school, which banned calculators. <laughs> and there's uh, me. I've got even more hair than I did as a child, or I do now. And, um, and my interests were computer studies, mathematics, and mechanical drawings. Because what I wanted to do is use all these numbers to create things. And I thought architecture would be the best thing I could do. Um, unfortunately, education had a different 
idea for me. And as um, Albert Einstein said, the only interfere the things that interferes with my learning is my education. So you know, follow your your true passion in education. Anyway, I got to the uh, science degree, and in science, I was most interested in the things that I couldn't understand. The subject that I did worse at one year was the subject that I chose the next year because that was an opportunity for learning. What's the point of learning the things you already know? And so each year I went from psychology to physiology and ended up in biochemistry. So the point is that passion is what makes learning stick. If you want to learn something, you will learn it. And that's what Leonardo da Vinci said, which study without desire spoils the memory and retains nothing. Another thing that um, science taught me, and this was an uh, essay that I wrote on selenium, which I, I got good marks for, um, the uh, reviewer thought there was an astonishing production because I had 170 references, which is pretty good for an undergraduate uh, essay. But what I wanted to point out, but the conclusion of that was that the intuition of unity amid diversity, which impels science, fits the selenium story. And ultimately, what we're trying to do in study is to understand the story, the story of a patient's disease, the story of um, what disease is. And that's uh, what science left me with, um, to understand these stories. Um, I did well in science, and, but I didn't want to study one thing for the rest of my life, and so I transferred to medicine. And medicine uh, gave me opportunities to do a wider, broader uh, study, so physiology and anatomy, which I hadn't done in the science degree. And I was very interested in the evolution of the human hand and wrote an essay on that topic. And in that, in that essay, I, um, I concluded, as others have done, that Aristotle's view of human beings, so why have humans got hands? And Aristotle's view was man was given these hands because he had brains. Whereas another philosopher said that man was given brains because he has hands. Now I want to take you through this because it's related to learning and computing and everything. So what man has is an opposable thumb. And that leads to incredible flexibility in the hand. But to do that, we've needed to expand our brain to control this hand. And half the motor cortex is de devoted to your hand. But not only that, but because now when you want to do something with your hands, you have to think about what you're going to do and use all those movements one after the other. Now that interaction of mi uh, hundreds of muscles co creating a movement that you want to do something is actually what people think what is what created language. Because those program movements that we have in our hands can be transferred to other muscle groups, including those of our vocal cords and our respiratory system and our chest. And so, so Anaxagoras' view was that because we had hands, we developed a brain, and because we had a brain, we developed language. And language itself is what leads to uh, learning. We can transmit that learning from generation to generation. So the idea of um, building on your learning, making it automatic, and then aiming it at a task or goal is truly what humans are all about in their learning. Now, I still was interested in computers. In 1979, um, the university bought this computer, a one of the first personal computers by Hewlett Packard, and it had 50 kilobytes of memory. And back then, we didn't know how we could possibly write a program that used 50 kilobytes. <laughs> and now our computers have like millions of times more memory, and we don't think it's enough. Um, I bought a computer, which I spent many, many hours on at home, and. Um, and I continued sort of this passion with uh, numbers and um, in medicine. Now I thought I'd finished, like some of you, I thought I'd finished after my science and medical degree with exams. But since then I've done 
membership exams and fellowship exams and other company directors exams. And really that just illustrates that um, we all keep learning, whether it's, whether it's formalised through exam processes or not. So Henry Ford, the great industrialist, said that anyone who stops learning is old. Whereas anyone who keeps learning stays young. To see my grandchild when he sees things and tries to understand them is truly what it's like to be young, to look at the world with wonder and try to understand it. And that's what I want to try to retain even when I retire from um, chemical pathology. So the greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. Now, um, these papers that I published, well, I didn't have to uh, write papers. Of 30 years in private pathology, you get nothing. You get no extra bonus for writing papers. People sort of wonder, why are you writing papers? You should be working. And so um, these, were, these papers were all just issues that I thought were of interest to me. I worked them out and then shared them with my colleagues. And that's what this meeting is about, is about sharing your learnings with your colleagues. Um, and there's just as many abstracts. Now that process of sort of investigating, looking for something interesting and learning what it means, is what Confucius describes, the three, met three ways that we might gain wisdom or learning. The first is by reflection, and that's the noblest. To stop and think for yourself about what you're observing and what you're learning. That is the noblest way of learning. There are other ways of learning. The second is by imitation. Somebody tells you something and you repeat it parrot fashion. That's very easy, but it's not a very noble way of learning. And there is a third way of learning, which is learning by your mistakes, and nobody really wants to learn that way. Now, as well as all the papers, I've been very fortunate to travel around the world giving lectures. And Whilst that might have been departing a lot of knowledge to people, um, the truth was it gave me a lot. Because to teach is to learn twice. You can't teach a subject and you've, unless you've learnt it at a deeper level. And so every time I give a lecture, I understand that topic even more deeply. And I feel sometimes I'm the greatest beneficiary of giving that lecture in the whole room. The other benefit in travelling around the world is this sense of perspective, that um, travelling around the world, this is a, a slum in India actually, where all of those children would love to go to school and get an education and have a career like I do. And it's a real privilege for everyone in this room to notice how privileged they are compared to most of the world's population in being able to have a career, to learn, and, and your obligation to keep learning and not to come back to the first world and think of how unlucky you are because the traffic's busy. Another thing that I learnt about learning is that it's not all in the textbooks. What this is showing is a baby in the sunlight. And I gave once a lecture to the doctors of uh, Sri Lankan doctors in Melbourne on vitamin D. And we were asking, one of the doctors asked me a question about how do you get a baby's vitamin D level up? And the answer from the doctors, well, you can get these drops and you could give them one or two drops every morning to get the vitamin D level up. And it was actually a Sri Lankan doctor in the audience who said, why would you do that? For centuries we've known you put a baby out in the sunlight and they'll grow strong. So these uh, common wisdoms are something that we need to learn and understand. Now, education is an admirable thing, but it's well to remember from time to time that nothing that is worth knowing can be taught. I think that, I mean, he was a deep cynic, Oscar Wilde, but he's sort of saying that there are some things that are in the textbooks that 
are not worth learning and other things that are yet to be learned that are worth learning. Now, one thing that you might know is that I have a presence on social media, which is very strange for a man with a white beard. But um, I was asked to give a lecture and somebody said, we'll put it up on YouTube. And I said, yeah, sure, I don't know what that's for. And, um, and then thousands and thousands of people have seen it saw that, those lectures. And so more people have seen my YouTube lectures than have ever seen my lectures in conferences. Um, one of the persons that saw those YouTube lectures was a movie producer. And he produced a movie called uh, That Sugar Film. And it had Hugh Jackman and Stephen Fry and me. Now, I was very hesitant to go into a movie in the theatres because and I had to speak to my therapist, actually. I said, I'm a pathologist. I'm not meant to be on the big screen. We're meant to be hiding in the laboratory. <laughs> but um, she embarrassed me because she said, you're travelling the world to teach a few hundred people and you'll give up the opportunity to teach thousands or millions. So she embarrassed me into, saying, into agreeing that our role in education is much broader than our immediate environment. We need to have the confidence and bravery to teach the world what we do. And so that was me, as I expected to be in the movie, and this was me as they put me in the movie, as a <laughs> Professor Blood, the vampire doctor. <laughs> anyway, so study what interests you the most even if it's in the most undisciplined, irreverent and original manner possible. That's what Richard Feynman, the physicist, um, uh, said. Now, I'll leave you with something um, else, my future interests. I'm not sure whether any of you will be able to recognise this picture. It's out of a Russian book. It's a fictional book. Um, you might think it's about religion. And that's one of my passions, is to understand religion, to understand the stories of religion and what they mean to, to people. You might think it's about Byzantium. And Byzantium was a period in um, Greek history in Constantinople where a lot of the laws of the world and the science and the religions of the world were um, refined. But if you notice that that's from J.R.R. Tolkien, that's what the book was about. So this picture represents my three new passions. Um, an interest in understanding religion, an interest in history, and an interest in uh, the fiction of J.R. Tolkien. And that's what I plan to do in my retirement, to learn these things and hopefully to pass on what I learn to others. So as Mahatma Gandhi said, Live as if you were going to die tomorrow. Make the most of your life. But learn as if you're going to live forever. These things I'm talking about are not going to be easy to understand. They're going to take the rest of my life, however long I'm lucky to have them. But wisdom is not a product of school. It's a product of the lifelong attempt to learn and to acquire that. So um, thank you very much for inviting me and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.